So Bio30, this will be our first lesson on the endocrine system. So in this lesson, I'll just introduce you to uh, an overview of the endocrine system. We'll talk about the two different broad categories of hormones, which are the protein and the steroid hormones. And we'll talk a little bit about some interactions in the brain between the hypothalamus and the pituitary gland. So this first picture that I have here, what I'm trying to show is that the endocrine system, as with the nervous system, it has to do with a couple of things. First of all, homeostasis, maintaining ideal internal conditions, and also communication. In the case of the nervous system, that communication is really short term in the sense that the chemical, biochemical message only has to diffuse across the synaptic cleft, whereas with the endocrine system, these chemical messengers, they're going to travel throughout the body, so much, much longer distance in terms of the message being sent. So uh, the endocrine system is sometimes called the hormonal system because it does involve the release of hormones into the blood. And for biology 30, there are in fact plant hormones as well, but here we are going to focus on the animal hormones and in particular mammalian and even more specifically the human hormones. So they are, uh, yeah, secreted directly into the blood, the circulatory system. They are for communication in terms of maintaining homeostasis throughout the body. So just like with the nervous system, they're going to have to be able to detect any changes that are taking place, whether it is in the internal or the external environment. And then they're going to have to, using these biochemical messengers, enable a response to take place in order to maintain homeostasis. We will come across a number of different hormones that are referred to as tropic hormones. So for example, gonadotropic hormone. And these are hormones that in themselves don't have any specific physiological function in the body other than to trigger another gland to release a hormone as well. So hormones, they're released in response to, yeah, all kinds of different stimuli, many, many different functions throughout the body. I just list three of them here, growth, development, and reproduction. And again, in terms of the long-term communication, they can reach all parts of the body, but it's not all parts of the body. It's not all cells, tissues, and organs that are going to respond to a given hormone. It's only ones that are going to be what we refer to as the target cells. And those are the ones that are going to have receptors that are going to be specific for that particular hormone, of which there are dozens of produced by the human body. So yes, they are chemical signals. They need to bind to receptor proteins. So these receptor proteins, as we will see, sometimes they are on the cell, sticking out of the cell membrane, kind of like those receptor channels for neurotransmitters. But in other cases, they might actually be inside of the target cell. So the hormone has to travel through the plasma membrane and into the cell, first of all. So once again, it's only going to be the target cells that are going to respond. And what we are talking about here are endocrine glands. Endo means in. So this is going to be the biochemical messengers that are released inside of the body. So this picture that we have here, so on the left-hand side, this cell, would represent a cell or a gland that is producing a hormone. The red dots, those are representing the chemical messenger, the hormone. And it is a hormone because it goes into the blood. Because it is transported in the blood, that's why it is referred to now as a hormone. Eventually, it will leave the blood and it will find its specific target, cells, tissues, and organs. And those are the only ones that are going to have the corresponding receptor that the hormone can bind to. And that's going to lead to eventually a response by those cells, tissues, or organs. So I just distinguished that initially between the endocrine and the exocrine glands. So exocrine glands, you also have these in your body, but they release their contents onto the surface of your body rather than into the blood. So the surface might be your skin in the case of your sweat glands, it might be your mouth in the case of the salivary glands. It might be the lining of the small intestine in the case of the pancreas, which also happens to act both as an endocrine and an exocrine gland. So the two different um, categories or classes of hormones, the first one, I'm just going to call it the protein hormones, but they do go by some different names. 
They're protein hormones because they are comprised of amino acids. All of proteins are comprised of amino acids. Virtually all of the hormones that we are going to talk about, they are going to be protein hormones. There are just a few exceptions that are the other categories, and they are only produced really by four different regions in your body. These ones here, they are water but not lipid soluble, which means they do not diffuse across the cell membrane. They do not actually enter the cell. They're transported fairly easily in the blood because blood is mostly water and they are water soluble. So the picture that we're taking a look at at the left hand side here, at the top, this would be our gland. And it looks very similar to what we saw with neurotransmitters. We have this vesicle that contains, in this case, the biochemical messenger, which is the hormone. So why is it a hormone? When it is released by exocytosis, it goes into the blood. So this is the blood that we're taking a look at here. That's how it's transported around, and that is why this is now going to be a hormone rather than a neurotransmitter. Target cell that we have here, it does have the very, very specific receptor that is for this and only this hormone. So that hormone, when it does make its way out of the blood, will bind to that receptor, and without actually entering the cell, it's going to lead to a response in that cell. So how is it then that we can actually get a response in this cell when it doesn't actually enter the cell? I'm just going to go back here and turn off my audio because this animation that I'm going to play for you here, I'm just going to narrate it to myself. Narrate it myself because the audio doesn't come out great. So we'll play it and I'll kind of uh, talk through here what is going on with this animation. So to orient ourselves, first of all, um, this is showing here our target cell. And in purple, this is going to be our receptor for a hormone that we don't see in the picture yet. So the hormone we refer to as the first messenger but in order to get a response in the cell, we're going to have, well, the title of this is a second messenger. And although you don't need to know all of the details of what goes on inside of the cell, the second messenger in this case, it's going to be something that is referred to as cyclical AMP. So taking a look at this animation, we see the hormone coming in here. That is our signaling molecule. And they say that in this case, it is the epinephrine. Binds to a receptor. And here, again, don't be concerned about all these details that we're seeing here. We have a cascade of reactions, enzymes that are involved, intermediates that are involved. But ultimately, what, what is going to happen is inside of the cell, it's going to lead to a change. And that change is going to be the activation of a protein that is already present within the cytoplasm. And this is just going to turn on this protein and lead to a cell change and lead to a response. So again, the actual hormone does not enter the cell. It needs to bind to a receptor that is embedded in the cell membrane, but that still does lead to a change inside of the cell. So that's what we see with the protein hormones, and we'll see it's going to be a little bit different with the other kind of hormone. This one here again um, is actually showing the same hormone, the epinephrine. Same thing, just in a picture. Here it does give us a couple of the different responses though. So this orangish band going across, that's phospholipid bilayer. And uh, this hormone here, epinephrine, is a protein hormone and it simply cannot cross that phospholipid bilayer. This is the receptor. Again, a cascade of a whole bunch of changes that you don't need to know anything about. But then it does say that we're going to activate this protein right here. And these are some of the responses that we're going to see inside of this cell when we do have the epinephrine that is binding to the receptor. So that is the way that these protein hormones are going to function. The other category or class of hormone, they are referred to as the steroid hormones. Again, there are some different names, but that's the one I will use. These ones are not made up of amino acids, but they're made up of a complex ring-like structure of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. These hormones, try and remember this, they're only produced by four different glands in your body. So one of them is the outer region of the adrenal gland, which is called the adrenal cortex. Cortex is on the outside. And these are a couple of the hormones that you will need to know about that are steroid hormones produced by the adrenal cortex.
The only other places have to do with reproduction. So in the male, the testes, they produce testosterone. That is a steroid hormone. In females, in the ovaries, estrogen and progesterone, those are steroid hormones. And if a female is pregnant, the placenta, which is the connection between the embryo, the fetus, and the mother, that will also produce these sex hormones, uh, estrogen and progesterone, which are also steroid hormones. Okay, so try and keep that in mind. It's only these four different patients. Anywhere else in the body, if it's producing a hormone, and then they're going to be the protein hormones. So the key with these ones that leads to the difference in terms of the mechanism is these ones are lipid soluble. So that means they aren't transported quite as well in the blood, taking a look at this picture here, but they can pass through the cell membrane. Okay, this is the cell membrane right here. So the hormone produced by a gland makes its way into the blood, leaves the blood. There's no receptor in the cell membrane. There might be a receptor in the cytoplasm, but it can pass directly through the phospholipid bilayer, not only of the cell membrane, but also of the nucleus. So this is the nucleus that we see at the lower right-hand side. It can go directly into the nucleus. So what can happen when it goes into the nucleus is it can have a direct impact on not just on the activation of proteins that are already there, but it can lead to the what we call synthesis or the production of new proteins. So similar animation here to show these events with the steroid hormone. So we have S for our steroid hormone. Here we're starting with the blood, not with the gland that produced it. A carrier because it doesn't dissolve that readily in the blood. Eventually though, that hormone is going to leave the blood. And take a look at this, passes directly through the phospholipid bilayer. Sometimes there's a carrier inside of the cytoplasm, but not always. At any rate, it's going to go into the nucleus. This is the DNA, that's the genetic information, and that's where the instructions are for the synthesis of proteins. So what it's going to show here, and again, you don't need to be concerned about all of the details at this point, is it's going to trigger the reading of information in the nucleus, the instructions from the DNA on how to make a protein, and then that's going to allow for the making, the synthesis of a new protein inside of the cell. And that actually happens inside of the cytoplasm, where we have the production of the synthesis of a new protein that they're showing here. All right, so key differences again. Um, really, it's that it does now pass through the phospholipid bilayer. It enters the nucleus. Not only does it lead to an activation of proteins, but it leads to the synthesis of entirely new proteins by that cell. So the example here, uh, estradiol is estrogen, the female sex hormone, and it's just showing that it passes through, again, the cell membrane. Here it does bind to a receptor in the cytoplasm into the nucleus, and the point is that it leads to the production of this here, which in fact is a protein. So this protein wasn't already there inside of the cytoplasm. It was synthesized, it was made new, because of the instructions coming from, or the stimulus coming from this hormone. So each hormone can in fact have uh, different effects on target cells, and that's because of various different things. Uh, there might be different receptors on different cells. Inside of the cell, what's going on with these changes, that signaling pathway, it's called the signal transduction pathway, that might be different in different cells. And there might be different proteins that are turned on in different cells as well, leading to different responses. Also kind of interesting, quite often other species, not just mammals, but other species um, also have the same hormones, but they might have different effects than what we do see in humans. So a really nice picture here that just kind of shows how one single hormone, and again, it's the same one that we're taking a look at here, the protein hormone epinephrine. This is the stress hormone. It is a stress hormone. You might know it by another name, which is adrenaline. And uh, this is a hormone that is produced by the adrenal medulla, which is the inner gland of the adrenal gland. Outer one is the cortex, inner one is the medulla. So what does epinephrine do when it circulates around? Well, it helps your body to deal with the stress. So a good example of stress, an excellent example of stress is just exercise. So what goes on during this stress? Well, your body needs some fuel, your muscles need some fuel, and that is glucose. So one of the things that epinephrine does is it binds to a receptor 
on your liver cells and your livers are, or your liver is one of the major storage places for glycogen, which is stored energy. And what epinephrine tells the liver cells to do is to break down that glycogen, release the glucose, which goes into the blood, and now you can circulate it around to your muscle cells that need that glucose for cellular respiration in order to contract the muscles. At the same time, you also need well blood going to those muscles. So epinephrine is also going to bind to receptors on different kinds of cells, liver, but now it's the blood vessels in skeletal muscles. And what it's going to do is it's going to tell them to dilate. What does that accomplish? More blood being delivered to those muscles that need the oxygen, that need the glucose, again, for cellular respiration in order to make the ATP. If it's a stress situation, like exercise, this isn't really the time to be digesting food. So epinephrine actually has the opposite effect on blood vessels that are going through your gut area. So there are receptors on these blood vessels as well, only now, as we can see, it doesn't lead to dilation, but it leads to constriction. You don't need as much blood going to your intestines to digest food if you're exercising or you're dealing with some sort of a stress situation. Regulation in biology, hugely important. So we'll talk about a, different, a couple of different ways that the endocrine system is regulated. Um, a huge one here, negative feedback. We're gonna come across many, many, many examples of negative feedback. And the other one, just a couple of examples of these are antagonistic hormones. One hormone does one thing, the other hormone is going to do exactly the opposite. So very shortly here, we'll take a look at a bunch of different uh, examples of negative feedback loops. And in the end, what it leads to is the inhibition of the response that you do get by reducing the initial stimuli. <coughs> so regular, negative feedback is going to regulate uh, many, in fact, most of the hormone pathways that we're going to be discussing. And the whole point, again, is to keep the body in homeostasis and not move it further away from homeostasis. Antagonistic hormone, hormones, we'll come across a couple of these. So um, two of them are insulin and glucagon. Both of them are produced by the liver, but they have, have exactly opposite effects. Whereas insulin is going to decrease the blood glucose, glucagon is going to increase blood glucose. So a few examples that we'll just kind of run through here, taking a look at negative feedback. This, in fact, isn't a bio-30 example, but we do have here, as food is going through the gut, the low pH coming from the stomach, the acid in the stomach, goes into the first section of the small intestine. That's going to lead to the production of this hormone, secretin, by the duodenum. And what it's going to do is tell the pancreas to release bicarbonate. Bicarbonate is a base, it's going to neutralize the acid that has now gone into the small intestine. So that's going to be the response, is the neutralization. Once you have neutralized it, well now you want to go back and kind of say, well we no longer have that stimulus, so you don't need to make the secretin anymore. You don't need to make the bicarbonate anymore. So negative feedback is going to ensure that yes, there is bicarbonate that is produced, but there's not too much that is produced and you're not wasting energy and resources making more of the bicarbonate when it's no longer necessary. So negative feedback is going to inhibit any further response when that response is no longer required. We're gonna see a pattern like this um, where we're going to see three different glands, a sequence of three different glands that I have labeled here as glands A, B, and C, and three different hormones as well. And the pattern is going to be gland A is going to produce a hormone and this is going to be a tropic hormone because its sole function is going to be telling gland B to produce another hormone, which is also going to be a tropic hormone because it as well is only going to tell the third gland, gland C, to produce this last hormone. So it's this last hormone that's really going to be carrying out the response and leading to a response. So why not just have one gland and one hormone? Well, this allows for a couple of things, very, very fine control and regulation of the production of the hormones, and it also allows for amplification. So hormones, they do work in incredibly low concentrations. We might be talking about parts per million 
parts per billion or even parts per trillion, very, very low concentrations of these hormones circulating around in your blood. And the sequence does allow for the amplification going from hormone one, hormone two, and eventually to hormone number three. But the point right here is that we also have this negative feedback. And the key is that it's this third hormone that's going to be regulating its own production. For this last hormone, if this is the hormone right here, so on the receptor cells, there will be a receptor for that hormone to lead to a response, but there are also going to be receptors on gland A and gland B and maybe even gland C. And when there are enough of those hormones circulating around, we get a response, but this is also a mechanism to say to gland C, there's enough of that hormone, so let's not make any more. To gland B, there's enough of that hormone, let's not make any more. And to gland A, there's enough, let's not make any more. So there may be all three of these loops involved. There may only be one or there may be two out of the three. But in this case, the negative here, it does mean that these are in fact negative feedbacks. So yes, sometimes there are long loops and sometimes there are the short loops that are involved. This is a specific example. The point here is not to memorize all the details, even though this is one that you will need to know all the details on. The point right now, though, again, is just to take a look at the negative feedback that it is showing in this picture here. So what we do have is the sequence of three different glands. So this would be our gland A. This would be our gland, oops, this one down here, gland B. And this would be our peripheral endocrine gland or gland C. This would be our hormone number one, it's a tropic hormone. Hormone number two, it's a tropic hormone. And hormone number three, that actually binds to the target cells and carries out a response. Once you do have that last hormone though, not only does it trigger the target cells and cause a response, but it also goes back to previous endocrine glands to regulate its own production. The final hormone is going to regulate its own production when the concentration is high enough and you don't, don't need any more of it to be produced. So it's not a good thing when you have an inappropriate response, a low response, but it's also inappropriate to have too much of a response. So this allows for that very, very fine control. So it, what, so it is an appropriate, finely tuned response that you do get. Um, there are also some examples of positive feedback, and there are a couple of them in biology theory that we won't actually see until we talk about the reproductive system. So instead of turning it off, this is actually going to lead to an even more enhanced response. So one of the examples that, again, we will eventually get to does deal with this hormone here, oxytocin. It's produced by the hypothalamus, released by the pituitary gland. And what it does lead to is the release of milk when an infant is feeding. So this response doesn't turn off any further production of the oxytocin. In fact, it turns on more production of the oxytocin. So more milk is released and there's more food that is available for that feeding infant. These are the major glands in the human body. And what I'm gonna talk about for the rest of this lesson is what is going on in this region right here with the hypothalamus and the pituitary gland. So those two, there's a very, very fine relationship and control that does take place between the hypothalamus and the pituitary gland. So we'll talk a little bit about those interactions. So if we take a look at this uh, cross section through the brain, you can only see this when you're taking a look at the interior. And what we're gonna focus on is the hypothalamus. They do have neurons or there are neurons in the hypothalamus but these neurons, they are secreting chemicals into the blood. In other words, they're producing hormones. And for that reason, because it is neurons that are producing these hormones, they are referred to as neurohormones that are produced by the hypothalamus. So yes, it is a little bit blurred when we're talking about this part of the brain. Is it neurons that we're talking about? Is it glands producing hormones that we're talking about? Well, it's actually both when we are dealing with the hypothalamus. So the hypothalamus is going to have an influence on the pituitary gland, which hangs down below the hypothalamus, and we divide it into two different categories. The anterior, that's the front. Posterior is the back. And what we'll see is that the hypothalamus 
it's going to influence the back of the pituitary a little bit different than the front of the pituitary. And by the way, um, this is also referred to as the master gland, pituitary gland, the master gland, because it has an influence on a whole bunch of other peripheral glands in your body, like gonads, testes, and ovaries, like the adrenal gland, the adrenal cortex, like the thyroid gland. But in reality, this master gland truly takes its instructions from the hypothalamus and from the central nervous system. So let's zoom in and take a look at that portion of the brain. So hypothalamus at the top here in yellow, uh, pituitary at the bottom. So the first couple slides here are taking a look at the posterior pituitary. This one's a little bit simpler because there are only two hormones that eventually you will need to know about, and they are ADH or antidiuretic hormone, and the other one that we actually just saw is oxytocin. At this point, you don't need to know any of the details about these two hormones. That's not the point of talking about them right now. The point of mentioning them right now is that it involves the posterior pituitary and the influence coming from the hypothalamus. So if we take a look at all of these cells here, you might recognize these. They are neurons, but they're a special kind of neuron because they are neurons that have at the axon terminal, a chemical that's released that goes into the blood. In other words, they're not neurotransmitters. They are now called hormones, even though they're released in exactly the same mechanism as neurotransmitters. So the hormones that are released from the axon terminal, they were actually made up here in the cell body. So that is why we say that these two hormones, ADH and oxytocin, even though they are released into the blood from the posterior pituitary, that's not where they're produced. They are actually produced in the hypothalamus. They travel down along the length of the axon, and when they get the stimulus, they are released into the blood. So for the ADH, the stimulus would be dehydration. For oxytocin, the stimulus would be, uh, well, birth itself. It causes uterine contractions and the delivering of milk, the contraction of the muscles in the glands, the mammary glands. So those are the only two hormones that do involve the posterior pituitary. And those two hormones are not produced there. They're produced in the hypothalamus. Little more complicated with the anterior pituitary. Again, we still see that we have these neurons, but notice that the neurons, they don't go all the way down to the pituitary. Hormones are still produced in the cell body. They travel down the axon, they are released, but where they're released is still in the hypothalamus. They go into blood vessels, and I just like to call this the local circulation. It's the blood vessels that are going between the hypothalamus and the pituitary. So those hormones, once they travel this short distance, they go out of the blood, and they bind to receptors on the cells in the anterior pituitary, and they then lead to the release of a second hormone. So all of these hormones here, released by the axon terminals, they would then be tropic hormones because they only go down to the anterior pituitary and cause the release of a second hormone, but it just turns out that all of these, or most of them, end up being tropic hormones as well. So there are, are a whole bunch of these hormones, but this is the pattern that we see. Now, the hypothalamus is actually that, in general terms, hormone or gland A that I was referring to. The pituitary, and this is specifically the anterior pituitary, would be gland B, and some sort of peripheral endocrine gland. The thyroid, the adrenal cortex, the testes, the ovaries, those would be the third peripheral endocrine gland. And this is where we have the sequence, where hormone number one, what they are going to be is into one of two categories. They will either be releasing hormones, abbreviated RH, or inhibiting hormones, abbreviated IH. If it's a releasing hormone, it just tells the anterior pituitary to release another hormone. If it's an inhibiting hormone, it tells the anterior pituitary not to release it. So whenever you see releasing or inhibiting hormone, these are hormones that are released by the hypothalamus that have an influence on the anterior pituitary in particular. So one example, in fact, that we already saw 
is thyroid releasing hormone is produced by the hypothalamus and it causes the anterior pituitary to produce and release what is called thyroid stimulating hormone, which then tells the thyroid gland to produce thyroid hormones, various different thyroid hormones that would then have various different functions throughout the body. So this picture here, and I'll show you an animation in a second, it shows eventually, yeah, there are a lot of them, hormones that you do need to know that are produced by the anterior pituitary. So these ones here, they would get a stimulus from the hypothalamus, and that stimulus is what is referred to as gonadotropin releasing hormone. That's why these two hormones are released. This one here would get a stimulus from the hypothalamus, and that stimulus is from the thyroid releasing hormone. ACTH gets a stimulus from the hypothalamus, and it's called CRH, corticotropic releasing hormone. This one here, there is both a releasing and an inhibiting hormone, PRH and PIH. This one you don't need to know about, and this one here as well, this is growth hormone. So there will also be a growth hormone releasing. Okay, so all of the releasing hormones and inhibiting hormones, they are all produced by and released by the hypothalamus into the local circulation. They are all tropic hormones. Of these ones here, they are all released by the anterior pituitary, and they are all tropic hormones, except for this one, which can actually be both a tropic hormone and have effects on its own. So let's take a look at a, uh, one more animation here, which is going to very, very nicely show us the anterior and the posterior pituitary and how they're a little different. So uh, yeah, we're taking a look at a brain here, of course, cross-section through the brain. We're taking a look at the interior. And so all of these structures, of course, you should already know the folded portion here on the outside. That is the uh, cerebrum, the cerebral cortex, the four different lobes of the brain. We can see the cerebellum, which is at the back. And then uh, we can see the interior structures. <clears throat> so this light color here, that is the corpus callosum the connection between the two hemispheres. Down below is the thalamus, and then down below there is the hypothalamus, and down below the hypothalamus is the pituitary gland. This is the pons, this is the medulla oblongata, and the spinal cord. So let's zoom in on now the hypothalamus at the top and the two different lobes of the pituitary gland, the anterior and the posterior pituitary. So they're showing that the anterior pituitary is glandular tissue, and that just means it produces hormones, and the posterior pituitary is not. It doesn't produce any hormones. So we're starting with uh, the posterior pituitary then, and we have these long axons of the neurons, which are neurosecretory neuro cells. The cell bodies are in the hypothalamus. That is where the hormones are produced, but the extensions go all the way down into the end, or posterior pituitary and that is where they are going to be released. They're basically showing two different colors here, and the idea behind that is that there are different sets of neurons that are producing the ADH than the cells that are producing the oxytocin. In both cases, though, they travel down the length of the axon to the axon terminal, and then they stay there until they get the stimulus for their release. When they are released, they go into the general circulation where they can reach potentially any cell in your body. So in the case of the ADH, the target tissues are going to be the kidneys. Uh, the stimulus is dehydration. So the response is actually going to be to pull back, to reabsorb the water, to conserve the water. And that also plays a role in maintaining the blood pressure. Again, we're not really concerned with the stimuli and the functions, the mechanism for each of these hormones. We're really just concerned at this point about how the hypothalamus is going to have an influence on the posterior pituitary and in this, in this case. So we have no tropic hormones here. Hormones are produced by the hypothalamus. They're stored in the axon terminal, which is in the posterior pituitary and that's where they are released from. For the anterior pituitary, again, it's many more hormones that are involved here, and they do produce, or there are hormones that are produced directly by the cells of the anterior pituitary. 
Again, very nice with the coloration. What they're trying to show is each one of these different colors are different cells responsible for the production of different hormones. And again, the same sort of color coding with these neurons that they're showing up in the hypothalamus. So the green will produce one kind of hormone, which targets the green cells in the, hypo, in the anterior pituitary and leads to the production of a third hormone. So very, very specific receptors. This is a hormone which only binds to this receptor and will only tell those cells to reduce or to produce and release the second hormone in this sequence. Again, in this case, it's going to be releasing hormones and inhibiting hormones that are produced by the hypothalamus. It's going to be the second hormones that are produced and released by the anterior pituitary. In fact, both of them are tropic hormones, but they have it labeled here as the releasing hormones by the hypothalamus and the tropic hormones by the anterior pituitary. And again, all of these eventually you do need to know, except for the last one. You don't need to know about that one. And the final slide here is just a reminder that there is a, a lot of information. Um, again, we haven't really been getting into any of the details yet, but for each one of the different hormones, it's a lot that you do need to know. So for each hormone, you need to know the gland that's actually producing that hormone. You need to know the target, or sometimes it's more than one target for that specific hormone. You need to know what was the stimulus in the first place that caused the gland to release that hormone. You need to know what is the response that you're going to get from that target cell, tissue, or organ. And then also the feedback, typically the negative feedback, sometimes the positive feedback. You need to know this for many, many different hormones. So as I say here, about 11 of them with the current unit and seven of them when we go on to the reproductive system. And this isn't really even taking into account those releasing hormones, the inhibiting hormones, and uh, the tropic hormones that are produced by the anterior pituitary.